jeepers! You're listening to Smash or Pass! Hello everyone, welcome back to another interview on the JB and Millie channel. I am JB and joining me is Millie. Hi! We have Sophie. Hey! And Tori. Hi! And the special guest who we'll be interviewing today is Mr. Michael Bell. Thank you so much for joining. My pleasure, absolutely. So... I really admire your whole filmography. You know, it spanned decades and there's so many amazing projects in there. But I guess I'd like to build a picture about at the start. So just looking through stuff like IMDb, I saw that your career really began in 1956. But prior to that, was acting always don't, your plan or was the different don't, routes? Don't look at that. That's a mistake. They start me... I don't know who that is. I I began in this in sixty or or sixty one or something with um, uh, oh god, it's not even listed. It, it's, it was a local. It was a it was a national television show called Verdict Is Yours, which they don't list, and a soap opera called Morning Star, hmm. and a, I can't think of what else, but nothing before that. So it's basically the sixties. They. I, I keep sending them the information and say, don't start me. I'm not that old. And I didn't start when I was in my in my you know teens. So no, but it's started in the 60s. Okay. And I guess kind of before you started acting, were there any, you know, movies or actors in particular that you feel, you know, influenced your career or that inspired you to kind of go down that path? You know, it, it, movies per se, just movies. I mean, I was a kid in Brooklyn and I'd go to the movies all the time. And uh, the big heroes, of course, in those days were uh, people later on I would not be interested in, but like John Wayne and, and uh, you know, people like of that ilk when I was a kid. Um, Lana Turner, who's a very famous actress who I eventually got to meet and which was an interesting story. Um, and uh, um, other, other well-known actors, I would have to say I was pretty much caught up in the Tarzan movies uh, with Johnny Weissmiller. I always wanted to be Bomb of the Jungle. <laughs> that was my dream. I said, oh, my God, I want to do that someday. I want to I want to ride elephants, which was really stupid, especially now what I know about riding elephants. But, and, you know, be around wild animals, et cetera, and, uh, and, and run around nearly naked with, with Johnny Weissmiller and, uh, and Marino Sullivan. That that's that's kind of got me going, but uh, I think later on in years when I got wiser and smarter, probably the Cary Grant films and <clears throat> things of that nature. Yeah, that's that interested me. So a lot of your earlier filmography was for live action roles. So how does preparing for a live action role differ from a voiceover role? Well, obviously it's it's how you look. Um, you you approach it pretty much from the same direction, except when you're doing voiceover, depending upon the uh, venue. If you're doing a cartoon, um, it's you've got to move it along because you have, especially in the days when I was doing it in the, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, they didn't have the digitalized setup. So it was all done by paint. Artists had to draw. So the mouth hat couldn't move that fast. So if I said, um, um, what do we do now, Batman? I couldn't say it that fast. I'd have to go, what do we do now, Batman? I'd have to slow it down because it too much work for the artist, too much, too much, I don't know what the hell they call it when they have to photograph it per second, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Now it's totally different. If you did, a, if you do a, um, an interactive game, you have all the time in the world because uh, the gamers don't you know they don't have to match that much they match it but obviously you it's it's much more of an acting chore it's not instant acting as it were um and on camera you got all the time in the world because they can just edit they usually when i would do television when i'd see a show that i guess starred in i'd come home and think wow that was that was pretty good i, I think i got some really good camera at that point and then I realized after it aired that they cut to the star of the series as opposed to the guest star. So my dramatic moments would be cut to Carl Malden or, or uh, you know, or somebody else who I'm, who I'm working with, who is the star of the series? You know, my whole 
snotty crying scene is all on him and then back to me and you see all my nose is running and they go, what happened? You know, it's just, so after a while you go, okay, fine. But that's, that's the difference, literally. Well, in terms of live action, voice acting or theatre, um, is there a particular medium that you enjoy doing more? Now, I think then I really wanted to do on camera for a long time. I love voice acting because um, I can do a lot of shows in one day. Or I could. I don't, don't do that much. Now I do mostly um, dubbing for Netflix shows. I, I dub foreign films. But uh, then, yeah, I, 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 um, I think voice acting um, because I could do two or three series a day which is more money. That sounds amazing. And are there any like favorite memories that you treasure the most from the early days of your career? Yes, I think my first introduction to uh, Mel Blanc. Mm. Uh, I think everybody knows who Mel Blanc is. Mm. He's, he's my hero. Uh, I was seeing a young lady named Joni Gerber, who's a wonderful actress, voice actress, and she kind of dragged me into the business, into the voice acting business, because I was doing it on camera at the time. She said, you've got to be doing the other stuff. It's so much more interesting. You get to play more characters, et cetera. And she was working a lot with Mel Blank and Noel Blank, his son. And she brought me in on one of her sessions at Noel's house, because he had his own studio. And she said, she said, Mike's really good, blah, blah. He said, oh, good. I have a thing here to do with my dad, with a young, a young fella. So Mike, why don't you go in with your dad? Just took a shot with me. And I went, wow, okay, and introduced myself to Mel, and Mel was very sweet, and he's really charming, and, and he said, Dad, uh, you're an East Indian, and that's that's when we can do, we could do characters then, foreign characters, you can't do that anymore, it's not allowed, the industry won't allow you to do it, but then we could do things like that, so um, Mel and Michael, you're going to sell him a rug, or you're going to buy a rug from him, or whatever. It's, it's for some food or something, I don't know what it was, radio commercial. And I said, okay. And we started in, um, and Mel started in, and uh, and Noel said, uh, Dad, I want an East Indian. You're giving me an American Indian. I want an East Indian. He said, okay. And he started again. He said, Dad, that's <clears throat> that's that's not an East Indian. And he said, oh. And he said, uh, Michael, do you do an East Indian? Yes. And and I, I looked at Mel and I said, I said, okay. And he said, go, boy chick. Go, of course, no problem. I said, Okay, because I studied dialects. I mean, it's, I did it all the time. <clears throat> and uh, and I did, you know, I did the whole thing like that, etc. You know, what a very, very good. I want to buy that rug for you. Do you want to buy that rug? And after it was over, um, he said, great, we got it. And I did this commercial. And I thought, I came home and I went, I not only worked with Mel Blank, I stole a job from him, from Mel mm. Blank. I did something that he couldn't do, and there was nothing that Mel Blanc couldn't do. I mean, he's just extraordinary. He sang, he, he all those characters. He was a wonderful actor. So that was a great joy. And years later, I got to do speed buggy with him. Mm. And, uh, we got to work together. Uh, and there's a story there. I won't go into it. It's a really funny, long-winded, wacky story about working with him. But other than that, yeah, that was uh, that stands out in my mind. Well, we do definitely have some questions, some like um, brief questions about the Speed Buggy series coming up later on. So perhaps that could be a way to fit that in there. But it is just incredible to hear about Mel Blanc because we spoke with Bob Berger not too long ago, who kind of gave us the whole backstory about how Mel Blanc was a way for him to kind of enter that industry. And in terms of your entry to, I guess, your first voiceover role, do you remember what that was and how that work came about? God. I think, I'm not sure. I think it was Hanna Barbera's Oliver Twist and the Artful Dodger. It was a special. Uh, and I had to play, obviously, a Cockney. Uh, and uh, the competition, one of the members of the, one of the guys in the competition was uh, Davy Jones from the uh, Monkees, who is English, who does sing. I don't sing. And, and, I'm, and I'm not a Brit. And I got the job and I thought, wow, somebody up there likes me. How great. And then, of course, I watched it afterwards. I went, God, what an awful singer I am. 
how terrible. I'm surprised they weren't able to fix it at the time. But that's right. You know, it, it was a job and, and Hanna-Barbera, the guys at Hanna-Barbera like me. They like working with me. So that was, yeah, I, I think I think that was the first. I'm just not sure. You probably know better than me because it's somewhere in the IMD, somewhere starting in the 60s. Yeah, IMDB says um, it was as Stutz in the Hound Cats. I'm not sure. That is it. Mm. absolutely it might have been and that they called me in and wanted me to do a takeoff on phil silvers who was a wonderful comic at the time who i also got a chance to work with and i didn't really know his 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 meter so i did um i did uh, what's his name from get smart and uh, they used that and another actor came up approached me a well-known actor now very famous actor who at that point wasn't famous, but he was starting to get there. He's really famous. And he came over and he said, because we knew each other, he said, so d what happened with that stuff in the background? Did, did, did you get that? Down? You know who got that? And I said, yeah, I got it. He goes, you did Phil Silvers? And I said, no, I, I did, what's his name? Who does Get Smart? He went, I do Phil Silvers. I did Phil Silvers. That's what I did. I did that. And I said, well, I don't know what to tell you. you know, what can I say? It's a, yeah. yeah, but I did Phil Silvers. I mean, I did a wonderful Phil Silvers this time. Anyway, he became a big famous actor, director at the I know. So. <laughs> oh, gosh, that's amazing. And there is certainly one project, in, well, a couple of projects in particular that we're really interested in, to speaking, you, in speaking with you about. And I guess they relate to Scooby-Doo. You went on to play various roles in the new Scooby-Doo movies, such as the robot gunslinger, Redbeard. Do you remember how you first came to work on Scooby-Doo? I believe it was the 1972 Scooby show when you first became involved. Yeah, because I was at Hanna-Barbera, so they'd call me in for guest spots. You know, Frank and and um, and uh, BJ and, and all the others were regulars on the show. And every now and then they'd have a guest spot. And because they knew I did lots of different characters, I guess it's easier for them to bring somebody in who they know they can trust and say, let's get them in, let's get them out. Because... Otherwise, we have a lot of studio time we have to pay for. And we don't want to have to nurture somebody and bring them through. So that was uh, lucky me. I'm, I'm, I consider myself pretty lucky, especially now with all the wonderful talent that's out there. I don't know. They may have been out there at the time, but it was sort of a, it was sort of a, a family almost. Uh, once they were comfortable with you and they got you and they said, yeah, why look for anybody else's? Other than when celebrities started to come in, then they started bringing years later, they started bringing celebrity guests. But that was years later. I mean, I just, I did anything Hannibal Barry came up with. They say, come on in. And I wound up doing Scooby Doo guest for, you know, guest stuff, because I could do dialects. So, yeah. I mean, I think that's something that certainly really illustrates your skill is one of the roles being Redbeard that was previously voiced by the late John Stevens and, and, in and in relation to that, it, you know, you had a pre-existing character there that you then had to, you know, revisit and do the voice for. Was there any kind of additional pressure surrounding that to have to voice something that had already been established in a way? And then, you know, it was left to you to kind of get a new take on that. Well, they play you uh, a scratch track. They play you who it is. And, and they, I think under those circumstances, they give you the opportunity to read for it. Um, because they want to make sure, because, you know, we have fans that say, oh, well, I know what that sounds like, and that doesn't sound like him or something. So they have to get somebody in there that does sound like him. So um, I think what I wound up doing, just auditioning for it, they said, yeah, it was the closest closest to it. And I've worked with John. I did a soap opera with John years ago, which no one even knows about. Uh, and when we ran into each other and had a barbara, I said, John, he went, Michael, oh, my God, uh, how interesting, because I was... Well, I was not a kid, but I was in my early 30s when I did the soap. So, uh, and John was one of the stars. Yeah. So, your new Scooby Doo movies had the crossover with Speed Buggy, where you played your role of Mark. Um, when it comes to Speed Buggy, some other actors that were in that show included Mel, Janet Waldo, Don Mezek, just to name a few. Um, do you have any memories of them that you can share with us? Just good boy good people janet rest her soul was fabulous what a lovely gal i mean you know in terms of vo um it didn't seem to be the kind of egos that i ran into with on camera um it wasn't about makeup and it wasn't about hair <clears throat> how my clothes fit 
It was what you could do to what you could do to deliver. And if sometimes they would say um, to one of us, if there were other guys in the show, um, okay, we need a uh, we need a leprechaun here. Um, Frank, why don't you try it? Okay, okay, good. Um, why don't you try it? Well, wait a minute. Uh, Mike, you try it. I go, okay, I go, yeah, okay, Mike, you do it. Yeah, Mike's got it. Nobody said, oh, well, I thought mine was pretty good. Oh, well, no one got angry and said, well, gee, later on, you know, during the break, oh, I thought mine was like, nothing like that. It was just, okay, sure. That's that's what the business is like, and it's what you do, and that's their choice. You know, that's their choice. That's what they do. Um, in on camera, it was deadly. On camera, when you were working with young, uh, pretty people, it was all about hair and makeup. It was all about, uh, can you want to run these lines? I, I can't. Uh, uh, not right now. I'm just, uh, and those were the guys. And just <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, so it's that's why it was so nice to, to be able to do that in what bo. Yeah, yeah, that was that was cool. <laughs> Next Scooby Show was about seven years later. You're credited as the voice of the Tar Monster, who is probably one of the most iconic Scooby-Doo monsters. I remember it terrified me as a child. It would it was like a special feature on one of my VHSs. I mean, just insane. What was this experience like voicing one of the most well-known monsters now? You know, I don't even, I, I must tell you, what's your name? Uh, my name's Tori. Sorry, Tori, uh -huh. I have no memory. I mean, <laughs> all the monsters run together in my head, if if I did something that was special, I'm thrilled that you even remembered. Um, I would get a you get um a, a drawing, and they'd say this is and so it was a big character. You do something big. It was a little character. You'd squeeze and nice little tiny thing and sit her. If it was a screechy dragon, you'd wind up going, Aah! you know, stuff like that. Um, I don't even recall. I just remember doing and i'm sure i visited those same creatures again for um um the uh the snorks or for uh, other animated shows that i've done i'm sure there's a, i'm thinking i'm gonna try this and i look around and nobody goes yeah you did that before mike i saw that on another they go oh that's good and they just move on <laughs> okay fine that's uh i'll be redundant that's uh i mean there's only so I, I know I listen to actors, sometimes well-known actors. One of them who does The Simpsons was on a radio show and he's, he's a man of a thousand voices. And I go, come on. And, it, and he didn't correct me. I said, you got, come on. You can, don't, Hank, you don't do a thousand voices. You do 20. And there's <laughs> permutations of the 20. But that's it, if you're fortunate. So uh I'm I'm glad you remembered it, <laughs> Tori. I I don't have a clue. Do you remember what it sounded like? I mean, I just remember it being so scary. I think it was the combination of the creature itself and being from Texas, and it reminding me of like oil. And I was from West Texas, and then just the sounds, and it was just it was one of those monsters that really stuck with me. Well, I'm going to have to Google Tar Monster. From Scooby Doo and Scooby Doo, watch, watch the episode. I'm, I'm going to do that as right after we finish what doing the show. I'm going to do that. I got I to see what it was I did. It's really funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can definitely vouch the Tar Monsters are definitely a voice that sticks in your head. Um, in another episode of the Scooby Doo show, you also voiced Ace Decay, who turns out to be the Phantom. Um, generally speaking, how do you approach products where you play more than one character? Well. It's, uh, you know, I teach voice animation. I, I've been teaching it for years. In fact, I teach it to Japanese students. I have been teaching for 11 years to students that come from uh, from Japan, um, sometimes 90 at a time. And the thing I teach them is uh, um, it has to come from, a, from an acting standpoint. And then you have to look at the drawing. How big is the character? Then how do you separate? Do you separate by voice? You separate by um, phrasing? and the tone of the character. Um, voice is really important because if he's here, or he's here, or he's here, you have to at least, you know, I teach in levels. And so I make my students go through terrible times 
and they have to go, I made them talk here, and they have to talk here, and then they talk their own voice, and they talk a little higher, and then sometimes they go over here. They never go over here because that's a puppet voice. So it's over this, you know, it's as high as they go. So then, and then you have to build around it. A very famous Brit, <laughs> Laurence Olivier, Sir Laurence Olivier, when they asked him about um, a particular character, I, I, I think it's Henry V, fifth, fourth, I don't recall, but, but he did say very clearly, it starts with the voice. It starts with the voice. I will start with the voice first and then we'll build the character around that. And that was interesting to read because it's something that I've been doing in voiceover in any event, you know. But it starts with the voice, basically pretty much looking at that and then you get onto the... Uh, you get onto the acting level. The only problem is in animation is if you're a bad guy, you're a bad guy. There's never a bad guy that cries over being a bad guy. I can't recall anybody crying over being a bad guy. They're just basically bad. Kids watch it, you're bad. You're a bad guy, you're a bad guy. So. Um, you played both Jesse Rotten and Jackie Carlson in the first ever Scooby-Doo movie, Scooby-Doo Goes to Hollywood. Um, from your perspective, how much of a change is there in production from a movie versus an episode? It's a, it's a, it's pretty much, pretty much the same. What production has changed is, at a certain point in our history, and I'm sure Bob Bergen's great in this because he has a sensational memory. We stopped working together and started working by ourselves, because a lot of the other actors, or even myself, if I was fortunate. We're too busy to be at a certain time in a certain place. And so they would say, okay, you're going to do this by yourself. And it, it was somewhat detrimental, to, I think, to the shows to some degree. I'm not probably the kids didn't notice it, but we did as actors because it's so much easier to bounce off another actor. When you're playing a character that's angry, how angry are you? <clears throat> because you don't know what the other character really sounds like, how they delivered their lines. That's how we are like in life. When we get into an argument, if somebody says to you, I think you're stuck up, they may have said, I think you're stuck up. Then you go, whoa, 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 wait. But if somebody says, well, I think you're stuck up, you go, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's a whole different approach, depending upon their approach to you and what they said to you. So we started working by ourselves. And I think in movies, it got to be that way um, with animation um, because they just... There's so much more to do. There was an hour and a half of a show or an hour and a half of something to do. And not everybody was available. And um, so I think it had a lot to do with it. Because when we did we did our shows for television, actually it was only a 15 minute show. The rest was commercials. So it was a short show. So we were all there. And it was great. Th those, were, those were the great times. It sounds like a real golden age for animation, for acting in general. Like, I always miss going back to those old bonus features and they're all in the same recording booth together. It just seems like a completely different energy. And I guess there's quite a big time skip in regards to Scooby-Doo projects now. So I think the next one that you appeared in was 1988's A Pup Named Scooby-Doo, where you played a lot of memorable and kooky characters. But what interested me about all of those roles is that it was always going into the duality of things so you played the human counterpart for example jack who became boo beard and another character that becomes stinkweed which is always quite a funny name to refer back to so what was it like to i guess play the cut and dry you know wake up in the morning like an old person version of a character and then dive into their kind of monstrous side you know, as an actor, you, you don't even give it that much thought, I don't think. You just, it's, um, once once you're in the race, you're in the race. Um, you don't even think of uh, preparation for the most part. You look at it and go, okay, this is, uh, this is where the voice is going to go. Um, and uh, I'll sound like this here. Okay, sound like Mike. You know, this is just, this is a Mike voice. And then uh, make the adjustment. Or, uh, you know, maybe you know, a slight adjustment, perhaps stick my jaw out so it sounds a bit more like this because the character looks like that. And that's the direction I would go in. And uh, you cobble it together. When I teach, I teach my students, you're Mr. Pota remember Mr. Potato Head. Did any of you ever play with Mr. Potato Head? And you switch it around and mm -hmm. you, that's what you are. You are Mr. Potato Head. That's what Mel Blanc was. 
It was just Mel Blanc, but he made just slight changes, generally vocally, as much as he could because he had a definite sound. But certainly um, attitude had so much to do with it. And it, you got the feeling it was another character. And so that's the only way you could approach it. So, you know, you didn't you didn't get a hernia doing it. I can tell you that. The big thing about it was it was always fun for us to test ourselves. Could I jump into it without them having me go back and do the other character afterwards? So they'll say, Mike, you want to just do it in succession? Or do you want to just do that character? And then we'll come back and I go, no, I'll just jump right at time. I'll just, I'll go from here to here to talk to myself. So what are you going to do now? I don't know. Well, what do you mean you don't know? I'm telling you right now, I don't know. Oh, okay, fine. Yay! Hey, Thank you. An award, please. That was always fun. <laughs> oh, that just sounds like you're such a great time. Man. I will admit, when I was going through your filmography, I kind of lit up a bit when I read a pup named Scooby-Doo, partly because it's such a memorable show, but also I was kind of like, okay, so now we're in 1988, so possibly memories are a bit more alive. And then I thought to myself, hang on, that's at least 10 years or so before I was born. So I was a bit like, huh, maybe it wasn't that recent. But kind of banking on my first assumption of that, do you have any favorite memories from your time working on a pup named Scooby-Doo at all? Oh, I, well, good God, I can barely remember what I had for breakfast. <laughs> uh, I have no memories of that. It was all, it's all a wonderful blur all of it because i did so much of it at the time i was i remember um one of the actors um olin sule who was batman who was the voice of batman years older than me used to talk about running from from uh, studio to studio because he did so much work as a voice actor running from studio to studio and then i wound up doing that many of us did that with the hannah barbara crowd and the uh um, even to some degree to run to Disney, then back to Hanna-Barbera and then back and back and forth. And and uh, so we were so busy. It's just, we literally, I'm surprised we didn't bump into each other constantly um, and bump into ourselves, quite frankly. Uh, so I don't even recall that particular show. I, rem I remember the show, but I don't remember doing the show. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's, I think there's very little other than, uh, Transformers and Rugrats were the only the shows I really have much of more of a memory of because it was more recent. Hmm. And I guess what are your favorite memories from Transformers and Rugrats? Oh, good. Well, Rugrats. Um, when we when we did Rugrats, I remember doing the um, a lot of the shows, but I remember doing the Mother's Day show when I had to explain to. Uh, um, Chucky that his mother was no longer with it, why he didn't have a mother and everybody else did and it was beautifully written beautifully written show and I had the opportunity to really dig deep trying to explain to my son why his mother wasn't around and it was a beautifully beautifully done show um, it was written beautifully well and when I finished uh, the scene I looked up and everybody behind the booth was crying mm -hmm. the engineers the direct they were all sobbing and then they said okay take two i said you want a second take okay <laughs> i did a take two and they were crying and they said it was so sad that they had to cut some of it because they were afraid they would just create problems money even then i i, I get adults say to me i cried so much during that show during the mother's day show but i have memories of that and memories of working with a very talented cast Obviously, talented guys, and you know, it's a good I, testament to your performance. And I just kind of wish that the whole medium of animation in general was given the respect it deserves because there are scenes like that, even in what people can perceive as a kid show, that are really like you know earth shatteringly good. It's, it's a shame that it doesn't really get that recognition sometimes. No, it doesn't. Neither does, for the most part, neither do the actors unless they're big stars. We have our local local awards. You know, I don't know what they're called, the uvula or so. I have no idea what the heck this award, what the awards are called, but they have local awards. And I remember at the time when we did, uh, when we were doing Rugrats, they said, we'd put you up for an Emmy for a voiceover. And then they went to the SAG Awards. I think it was the SAG Awards. And they said, oh, we're not giving out Emmys for, uh, for voice awards. We don't give out voice awards. Mm -hmm. That was then. I think the year later they decided to give them out. I think, in fact, I directed... Um, 
Tim Curry in Peter Pan. I wound up being a director and I directed him in Peter Pan with Jason Marsden and a whole slew of wonderful voice actors, Tony Jay, et cetera. And uh, at that time, uh, they said uh, uh, they started giving out Emmys. And I think Tim won. Uh, he played Captain Hook. And he won an Emmy. And I was very obviously elated because I had directed him in it. But it was before that, they weren't giving out any any awards for uh, major awards for voiceover, which I was sad because I thought it would, we we did get a, I think I have it there. It's a, a Television Academy Arts and Sciences for best daytime Emmy to Michael Bell, but part of an ensemble, which is fine. I'll take that. It's certainly like you say, it, even if it was a year, you know, later, it's certainly a recognition that was deserved and that was due to have an award um, like that. And I guess kind of we are starting to catch up to more present day things. I know, JB, as you were working your way through a pup named Scooby-Doo there, I think it kind of brings us up to the most recent Scooby project you worked on, which um, was actually my favourite Scooby-Doo movie, uh, Scooby-Doo and the Loch Ness Monster. So do you remember working on that? Well, I appreciate, like you said, a lot of it kind of runs into a blur but I think you illustrated really well a few minutes ago how well you can switch between voices and things like that and I think this was one of the ones where you really were credited for quite a few and it's interesting Alistair Duncan is a wonderful wonderful actor who is a Scot read for it and he said I don't believe you got it and I said I did didn't I yeah I said I, I, I just studied it I had been studying the dialects especially Brit especially Scottish. I mean, those were important dialects for video games. I never knew I'd be called upon to do it. And uh, and so when I got it, I was I was elated, quite frankly, because it's such a fun role. He's such a creepy character, the uh, the character in the Loch Ness Monster. And the minute I saw Loch Ness, I said, OK, I'm, 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 I immediately went right to my dialect information and because and brushed up on it and and uh, watched um what's his name 007 movies to make sure that i was really mm -hmm. clear on it and uh, a couple of wonderful uh, actors and now of course so much stuff on britbox and so much stuff that i'm i'm sorry i'm not starting over in that respect because so much so much to glean from i tell my students watch britbox watch what's what the even even if it came from 2004 whatever it is that's how you're going to learn uh, your dialects. You don't listen to anybody else. That's that's where it comes from. But that was fun. That, yeah. that was a yes. Yeah. I mean, that sounds really interesting because you were oh, listing oh. there the movies that you'd you know watched to help you prepare. I was thinking that there must have been you know for your study of dialects a lot of travel that you've done and kind of hearing different voices in different places. Did I guess the work that you've done ever bring you to Scotland or the UK in general? Went to the UK, but none of the work. None of the work. I just had to visit. I had to visit. Somebody said to me when on our honeymoon, my wife and my wife um, Victoria Carroll, who was uh, also on camera actress, but wound up doing She Hulk to my to my uh, to my Hulk. Um, and uh, we went uh, on our honeymoon to uh, to England and to to London and to Paris. And when somebody said to me, I think it was I think it was London cabbie said. So how did you like Paris? And I said, you know, I think Paris was lovely, but I wish they had filled it with the with the with the Brits or the Irish. Then I would have been a lot happier. Because those people were really lovely. The Irish were lovely, the Brits mm -hmm. were lovely to us. They were really everybody was lovely to us. Parisians weren't very nice. But beautiful country, beautiful country, and seeing so much. In fact, we went to the theater in London. And saw guys and dolls oh. and, uh, in London at that time in the eighties, and um, it was brilliant. And they, I said, "Oh, they're not going to do American violence," and they were sensational, just sensational. And we went backstage afterwards because I, I had to say, "You guys were great. You know, here we are, actors, and we're sitting and we're and we're screaming and we're laughing and we're having the best." time and i'm going that's they're great and the the, the british uh the audience is like this and i'm going oh my god and we're, we're you know american, <laughs> loud americans so we go back and we see the young actress who's who's playing the lead role 
And we walked up and I said, hi, my name is Michael. It's my wife, Victoria. We're actors from Hollywood. I got to tell you, you are sensational. I, I wish we had mastered your dialect the way you mastered our dialect. Sang, you just, she said, do you like it? Do you really like it? And she said, oh, I love you, Americans. You're so good. You're so loud and boisterous. You, you love a show. You scream. You yell. You cut our audience is like, oh, I really love you. And she did a whole thing. And I said, it's great. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I got to get your name again because I got to remember it to all my friends. She said, it's Tracy, Tracy Oman. Oh. Oh. So just... It's in the 80s. I mean, you know, it's just, oh my God. And years later, I said, that's, that's Tracy. We, I think we saw her. I said, my word, years later, we saw her in, in Guys and Dolls. She was, and we had to look up the program and sure enough, sure oh. enough, it was her. That's such a crazy story. I mean, I absolutely love London. Even now, I mean, I don't know how. I mean, how long do we live away from London? My geography is it's about four hours on a train, three, oh, four hours. Now I'm just like, I just wish that I could find like 10, 20 things to sell, get the gas, get the bus ticket, or whatever, just head to London. And I guess like a bit of a selfish question on my end is, would you ever consider coming back for like a fan convention or in any capacity, you like gracing well, England I, yeah, once more? I, I would have to be invited. Mm. I'd have to be invited. I can't just, you know, can't just pop up and say, hi, I'm here. <laughs> uh, I was in, uh, oh God, I want to say Brighton. No, Bristol. No. I was in some place. I was years ago. Um, I was invited there and it was, it was really a lovely event. Uh, and I know they have them. I know they have cons uh, in, in England. Uh, and I've never been back since, uh, but it has to come through my agent because they, they, they get the call and say, we want Michael to come back or something. They better get me soon. I'm 84. Come on, guys. I just mm -hmm. checked my watch. I got to, I just checked my x-rays. I'm okay, right now. Okay. But uh, I'll, 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 what I'll do, I'll make it my personal mission to try and like tweet at the local conventions as like, come on, let, let's do it. Let, let's get in touch. But I guess that's all of the questions that we are down for you today in terms of, I guess, what you've done in the past. And I guess for now, we'll look to the future. So I'll pass on to Tori for the kind of the final two questions, if that's OK. Good, Tori. Yeah. So do you have any upcoming projects that you could share with us or any cons you may be attending apparently in London? No, no cons in London. I, the only cons I have are all stateside. You know, I think I have something coming. I won't do, there's now all of a sudden I've become so political. I won't do anything in Texas. I'm not going to do anything where they, uh, where they prohibit uh, abortion. I just won't do it. I will not work with people. I will not go see people who are so opposed to my way of thinking uh, that are, um, against Planned Parenthood, I just I won't have it. So I do some states, um, mm. mostly the Eastern states, uh, and I'll be doing something locally, I think on March 11th and 12th, I think I'm gonna be in Burbank or Anaheim or something like that. I don't like traveling much anymore. I'm really, um, it's really gotten to me. And unless, I go, unless I can go first class, I go first class, <laughs> but I'm not gonna travel tourist anymore it's not going to do it it's just uh because they have you running from from airplane to airplane from from yeah. from one to, and it's uh, it's just you know alan oppenheimer alan oppenheimer with the two you know you know who alan oppenheimer is do you know alan oppenheimer the actor he was skeletor in um uh, in the in the he-man series and he is older than me and he and i hobbling along with a couple of crazies trying to get from one Plain to another, just said, "All right, this is this is nuts. I can't do this anymore. So uh, I'm not going to do that." But yeah, I, I'm, I'm. What's that? The U.S. airplanes are the worst. Whether oh. you're old or young, it's atrocious. The oh, connection. God. Dallas connection. Oh my God, Dallas! Oh, you have to go to up a thing to a train and then catch a train <laughs> to someplace else, and you're lugging. And I've got all these pictures, and I've got these posters, and I've got my things that I got. It's, you know, it's just too much. It's, you know, it was great, but not anymore. I'm not going to do it anymore. But if I go to London or if I got, because they have them, they have them in Russia. They have them in Paris. Mm -hmm. They have events in Tokyo that one of my friends went to Dubai. And I said, that all sounds really interesting. Then I might put up with something, but just to, uh, to go to, uh, you know, to, I guess, to Texas or 
Michigan or wherever. No, it's not going to happen. I guess the well, lucky part of coming to... in, sorry. Oh, you go, sorry. sorry. I was going to say the lucky part of coming to the UK is once you're here, that's kind of it. There's not that you need to then get a connecting flight to somewhere else. It pretty much that's just right. all one place. You just hop on the bus or right. a taxi. Hey. I had a friend who went to Ireland. They said, oh, my God, Ireland on a con. How great. What a great fun that would be. What what a, what a treat that would be. Mm. Scotland. Oh, yeah, I'd go in a second. Absolutely. But uh, local to the to the West, nah, I don't think so. Well, I think it's the 20th anniversary of the Loch Ness Monster movie next year. We could at least plead with some of the <laughs> cons over in Scotland. 20th anniversary, Loch Ness Monster. We're bringing it back. There you go. Now, who who is who is still with us from that series? Who do we know is still around? Ooh. Frank Walker is Frank still. Walker. In fact, he goes to um, Edinburgh Comic Con, is it? Like Frank quite Walker. a lot. Yeah. yeah he does. We were gonna go, but then it was cancelled with the pandemic, so we had to yeah. stay sheltered here. But oh yeah, Frank Walker, Gray Delisle, uh, Mindy Kaling still around. Yeah, Gray, Gray's enormously talented. There's some wonderful people still around. Still youngins. Still around, I talk, call Frank a youngin. Frank, um, a, a story. Frank and I did uh, Scooby Doo together. Uh, not Scooby Doo. We did um, the uh, um, Snorks together, and I was All Star, and he was another Octo, Octi, or something. And in it, I at one point I had to speak underwater, just at one point. And they had the the lines were going this, and the director said, "Mike, okay, let's do your lines." And I thought, I have to speak underwater. They're not going to do it mechanically. So I took a sip of coffee or water and I went, <laughs> sorry, and I was joking. I said, I'll try it again. <laughs> Damn it. So then director says, Frank, why don't you do your lines first and then Mike will follow your lines. And I said, fine, let him go. And Frank went, okay, what are we do now? Oh no, where are we going to go? And I said, well, Frank, why didn't you show me how to do that? <laughs> and he said, well, I was having so much fun watching you drown. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, no. So the where is the best place for us and people watching this video to keep up with your work and keep track of maybe all of these fun conventions mm -hmm. you'll be able to go to? You know, I guess uh, Celeb Works represents me. It's called C E L E B W O R X. And they're probably, you can Google them. They have a list of all their really sensational clients. They handle almost everybody in the Transformers, a lot of people who did uh, Scooby Doo. Um, I think even they even have, they even have the gal who did Tinkerbell from the original Disney and the guy who did Bambi, who's a wonderful old dude. He was the voice of Bambi when I was growing up. And they have a, a lot of young, new uh, talent for voiceovers there. So CelebWorks has a whole record of what we're doing and where we're going and, you know, et cetera. And for me, um, stuff that they can people can see, there's not much now that I'm doing other than dubbing. I'm dubbing for networks. I just dubbed a movie called Troll, mm. which was a huge success. On, on, and then I'm, I'm doing... A, I do video games. I do a thing called, um, good God, they just contacted me again. I've been doing this every year. Heart, Heart, Hearthstone, I think it's called, for Blizzard. And it's a video game. And I've been doing video games for years. And that's that's great fun. Those are basically the stuff that I'm doing now. I've been still reading for series, but nothing has uh, come up. So a lot of young, really good talent out there. So the fight is uh, kind of great. Now, I guess they kind of figure, well, look, you know, how old is Michael Bell? Okay, we want this series to go for another at least three or four years. He's 84. I don't know if he's going to make it to 90. Let's go somebody younger who can do old. All right. That's fine. Good matter. Yeah. Give somebody else a shot. Oh, well, I mean, it has genuinely been an absolute pleasure to speak with you today. I mean, I kind of just feel like I'd love to, to just sit in a room with you and go, okay, please, can I we have... 10 stories or just and just keep going like one of the old arabian night things okay let's do 10 stories every day and we'll keep because genuinely i could just sit here and just listen to to all the stories you've got to tell so thank you so much for all the time that you've given us today 
for me it's the voices that are mesmerizing like as soon as you've gone into one of the voices it's been it's it's always just so difficult to comprehend that it's the same person on the screen it's oh. fantastic I, it's been amazing to hear yeah we always I love, love hearing that. stuff like that because i love hearing that <laughs> well my daughter has taken over my career to well basically on camera but vo uh, ashley bell if you look her up imdb ashley bell beautiful little redhead and uh she's her career is sort of zooming which is nice and uh mm -hmm. so we, we're reveling in her career now as opposed to mine or my wife's yeah oh, oh, definitely be sure be sure to look but up and again yeah. like just marveling at how well you do things it's like for me to put on a voice it's like okay i have to take a deep breath and then prepare but the fact that you can just do it like it's it's no more different than me speaking normally is absolutely incredible and so, then switch between what, the I two. Do, what i want you is go to youtube Go to Michael Bell Voice Animation Class. Uh, I teach an hour and a half. It's free. I, I, there's no charge for it. It's a free, and I teach how to do voice animation, how to create characters. So when the time comes that you become mommies and daddies, and I expect that'll be somewhere in the, the next 10 years or eight years or whatever it is, you can tell bedtime stories and play the witch and the warlock and the ogre and the evil queen and the evil king, et cetera, and the giant and and whatever and you will be able to draw from from my class for about an hour and a half that sounds amazing it's great to hear they're on youtube we'll put them in the description yeah, below. that's that's so incredible thank you so much so um i guess thank you so much again to people watching this and keeping up with them every week it means a lot to see all the support come through and of course to help us do these amazing experiences and of course thank you so much to sophie she does amazing artwork of scooby-doo stuff so i'll leave all of her links in the description down below along with tori who like has got me into reading actually i will confess i dropped off on it for ages so any of that stuff i'll leave tori's links in the description down below so if you do want to see more then please like comment and subscribe to jbn millie and we'll see you next time